The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, black hole at the center of the Milky Way identified as 250 million year old belly lap at the Permian Triassic extinction event, reversing centuries of speculation that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain's assistant editor, Christopher Rocchio. And I'm Bain intern, Taylor Panachone. This time, our David F. Sherrod interviews Astrid and Greg Bear. Greg, you may know, is the award-winning, best-selling science fiction writer. And Astrid has been involved in science fiction and science fiction fandom for decades as well. Astrid Bear also happens to be the legendary SF author Paul Anderson's daughter, so we thought it might be most excellent to talk to her and Greg about Paul Anderson's work and legacy. And the new edition we've put together of Anderson's Psychotechnic League stories and novels. Out now at Booksellers is the complete Psychotechnic League, Volume 1. We are going to issue all of these stories in three volumes over the next year or so. They are amazingly good reading still, of course, and David F. Sherrod, who is heading up putting the collections together, talks to Astrid and Greg about that and all things Paul Anderson. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Leaden Universe novel Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Now here's the news! The October EARCs have finally arrived. Tell us what an EARC is, O oh wise intern Taylor. For those of you who don't know, EARCs are a special kind of arcane generator that we have here at our Bain offices. They run the very important task of powering the tiny mechanical butlers each of our authors have at home so that they may never run out of freshly brewed Bain endorsed coffee. Is that really is that really what they are though? No. Yeah, no. I, I, didn't, I thought you were just joking. <laughs> EARCs stand for Electronic Advanced Reading Copies. So, unfortunately, if you buy one, you won't receive a robot in the mail ready to serve you some of the finest coffee in the universe. However, you will receive a copy of a newly released book four months or so in advance. That's right, folks. If you've got nothing else to read and can't wait to grab a copy of your favorite author's next book, you can always go to the EARC right away. First, there's the Cobra Trader EARC by Timothy Zahn. This is the final heart-pounding installment of the Cobra Rebellion trilogy. Two Cobra clans, the Moreaus and the Brooms, refuse to sit idly by as they watch their world fall under the oppressive regime known as the Dominion of Man. But with the ever-ongoing struggle between their alien invaders, the Troughs, overthrowing the Dominion isn't as easy as it seems. Cobras are not known for taking the easy path, and this may be the hardest path of all. But if the Cobras can manage to avoid complete destruction and abject slavery, a new day may finally dawn on the Cobra worlds, the Day of Freedom. Also out in EARC is the new Liaden Universe novel. This is Neogenesis by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. A war waged hundreds of years in the past brought forth the complex logic laws. Because humans blamed their own tools for nearly annihilating them as a species, AI navies were banned. Manufacturing and sheltering an independent logic became illegal. But some of those AIs stayed under the radar, creating a support network with hidden yards where smart ships were manufactured and humans specially trained to ease a new intelligence into the universe socialized them. Among those with a stake in the freedom of independent logics is Theo Waitley, captain of the intelligent ship Betchema. And then there's Uncle, a shadowy mastermind from the old universe, a man with no regard for the boundaries of law, both natural and man-made. And the puppet masters of the Liar Institute, with a history just as murky, all have an interest in the newly awakening self-aware logic that is rumored to have the power to destroy the universe. The question is, who will get there first? EARCs for Cobra Trader by Timothy Zahn and Neogenesis by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller are exclusively available at Bain eBooks. Of course, they are available in all formats, including Kindle, as are all Bain eBooks. Both are January print books, so if you can't wait, get these EARCs now. Hooray! 
Hi everyone, it's David F. Shirod back here on the Bane Free Radio Hour. If you had hoped you were rid of me after the last few weeks of me sitting in for Tony, you will be sorely disappointed. But you will not be disappointed by the, our topic of conversation today, and that is Paul Anderson's uh, The Complete Psychotechnic League, Volume 1. We are going to be talking about um, Mr. Anderson's uh, original future history that he wrote. And uh, we're going to be talking about his other works as well as his life. Uh, joining me is a man who here on the podcast needs no introduction, Mr. Tony Daniel. Uh, I will just say, of course, he is a science fiction writer and editor at Bain Books. He does the podcast. You heard his voice 30 seconds ago. And uh, his most recent novel is <clears throat> his most recent novel is The Amber Arrow, which is a young adult high fantasy novel. Tony, uh, thanks for sitting in on the conversation with us today. Sure. You're not going to do the interstitials? Oh, you want me to do the interstitials? I can. Yeah. You want me to do everything? I'm joking, David. Go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Hardy, har, har, Tony. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, also here is Astrid Anderson Bear. She is the daughter of Paul Anderson. She started reading science fiction at an early age, attended Apollo moon launches in the press box at Cape Kennedy, and hopes to someday see this planet from above. She has served as an advisor to the Scout Online community, is member of the advisory board of the Washington State Centennial Time Capsule, and a former board president of the Friends of the Un University of Washington Libraries. Uh, Astrid, thanks for coming on and talking about your dad's uh, work with us today. Happy to be here, David. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, along with uh, Paul Anderson's daughter, we have his son-in-law, Mr. Greg Bear. Uh, he is a storyteller with over 30 novels on his rap sheet, including Blood Music, Eon, Forge of, the, uh, Forge of God, Queen of Angels, Darwin's Radio, City at the End of Time, and most recently, the final volume of the War Dogs trilogy called Take Back the Sky. His newspaper and magazine articles have covered topics from film to biology to planetary science, including the Voyager missions to the outer planets. He has consulted with Hollywood masters and served on space advisory committees and committees devoted to science and international politics, uh, which maybe can lend some insight here when we talk about uh, the politics of uh, the Psychotechnic League. Uh, he was also one of the pioneer founders of San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, Greg Bear, thanks so much for talking with us today. My pleasure. Good to be here. Hey, David, we should also add that yes. Greg is an incredibly generous um, uh, uh, mentor and, and helper of, of writers, including me, when I was coming up. <laughs> From the Clarion Group. We've been doing that for a good long time now, yeah. Yeah, many, many, uh, Astor and Greg's kindness to a science fiction community is legendary. Well, i got to say that Astor's the one who feeds them, though, and so she's she's primary, I think. And we have our, our fourth week clarion party here. She she provides the food. We've got to take care of those young, up-and-coming whippersnappers like you, Tony. <laughs> yeah, not so young anymore. <laughs> David, well, that me, me. my gosh if you're not young then what am I <laughs> well I, I taught <laughs> David so in a way Greg uh, you've mentored David I want to say I was going to say um, since we're talking about this um, I read um, Greg Bear your stories first um, in Tony Daniels uh, literature of science fiction and fantasy class at the University of Texas at Dallas. So, yes, it's all, um, <clears throat> you know, the the intricate web of uh, science fiction fandom, I guess. So, uh, so I wanted to start, uh, Greg, with you and Tony, um, and uh, we'll talk to Astrid in a second because she'll have a slightly different question, and you'll see why in a moment. But um, when did you first become aware of uh, Paul Anderson's work? And if there was a specific book or story that you remembered um, what was that, and what was that like discovering him, if, if you do, in fact, remember? Well, I kind of remember because I was in Kodiak, Alaska, as the son of a naval uh, officer, and uh, there was a base library there on Kodiak, which had a lot of classic known press and other volumes, and they had collections, the uh, Ted Dick, Dick, T, Dick T volumes, uh, they had all of those, and I started reading short stories, and that's probably where I first encountered Paul. I don't remember the exact story, 
But I do remember in the same uh, situation coming across the High Crusade, and that was perhaps the first time I really became aware that I loved Paul Anderson's work. Yeah, it was and the High Crusade you... for me as well. Yeah. Um, and over the next few years, that's... what I did was there was a whole bunch of uh, books being republished. I believe uh, Berkeley was doing them and pocket books and so on. And ultimately, in 1970, I had read Tau Zero. And around the same time period, The Broken Sword, and boy, those really threw me for a loop. I thought those were fabulous. It seems like High Crusade is a um, a common entry point, and we should mention, um, I think it's still available from Bain Books. Bain did a 50th anniversary edition of that a while back, I remember. Um, That's right. Astrid, yeah, and I, and I, we, I think we both did introduction pieces for it. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, Astor, I want to ask you a similar question, but um, slightly different for obvious reasons. Um, do you recall when did you realize your dad was kind of a big deal? Like, or or did, was it always just kind of a gradual thing where, um, you know, you were used to being part of this science fiction royalty in a way? <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it was just part of the the background of my life. Um, and what I, I do recall, though, is when I started reading his work, uh, when I was about 12 or so, we were repainting my room. And so all my bedroom was all a who and out of order for a couple nights. So I was sleeping in a study because there was a, a bed in there. And so there were all these Paul Anderson books on the shelf right above me. And so I pulled one down. It was um, Agent of the Terran Empire, and because I was really into Man from Uncle at the time, and so Agent of something or rather just kind of caught my eye. So I was reading the Flandry stories, and I thought, "Whoa, this is pretty good stuff." <laughs> and I just started reading more Paul Anderson. <laughs> so did you tell him you liked it, or did you like try to play it off? You were like the jaded preteen, like I guess it's okay, Dad. <laughs> you know, I don't remember. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, let's talk about, um, I guess let's talk about for people, surely everyone, I hope everyone has heard the name Paul Anderson at least a little bit, but we should talk about him, um, specifically, uh, he was a very prolific and popular writer in science fiction. Uh, he won the Hugo Award seven times, uh, Nebula Award three times. He's a grandmaster of the science fiction writers of America, um, <clears throat> wrote over a hundred novels and story collections, several hundred short stories. Uh, and he was part of that first wave, really. I mean, I guess Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, but that golden age uh, of science fiction with Robert A. Heinlein and Isaac Asimov and um, Arthur C. Clarke. And um, I just wonder, Astrid, maybe you have some insight into this, because it, it was it's hard to imagine now how underground science fiction was back when he was... Uh, getting into it and writing it. And I just wonder, um, did he have any stories about what appealed to him as a young man uh, that w drew him to this kind of this kind of fiction, which at the time was kind of sneered at and looked down upon and very underground, as I said. Right. And to go back a little bit, I would say he was a kind of third wave. So you ha you'd have Byrne and Wells, and then there were the, the great pulp writers of the 20s and 30s, um, Jack Williamson and Clifford Seamock and so on. Um, and so I was just rereading a, a, um, an essay my dad did for uh, contemporary authors. I was kind of going over how we got into science fiction. So I, I, I have a better answer for this than I might have had yesterday. Um, so he hadn't been reading science fiction as a young, as a very young man, but he had a, a friend that he'd met in high school um, who sent him, and then he, uh, when they were living in D.C. for a while, and then later um, this friend mailed him a box of, of books in Minnesota, and which included some pulp science fiction and like planet stories and stuff. And he had not dived into it before that, but he trusted his friend and started reading this stuff and thought, wow, this is really good stuff. Got a similar experience to me and um, just got kind of hooked into it. And then later when he went to, uh, um, went to the University of Minnesota uh, for college, he connected with the um, uh, Minnesota Minneapolis Science Fiction Club, whatever it was called at the time, and got to meet Clifford Seamock, who was kind of a mentor to him and you know one of one of the gods on earth, as as he put in this essay that to be able to meet Clifford Seamock was amazing to him. And so that 
just drew him into the field and and inspired him to um, continue writing because he'd been doing that and and so he started selling stories while he was still in college. Very cool. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about um, the complete psychotechnic league. This is the first volume. Um, Jim Bain brought these out uh, while he was working at Tor. Uh, and uh, Bain is now reissuing them. Um, we're also adding in some new uh, material that was, uh, for whatever reason, left out. Um, this first volume um, actually is is not doesn't have anything uncollected in it, but the second and third will both have a handful of stories that have not been collected uh, as psychotech in a psychotechnic league volume. Um, so this was his first stab at a future history. And uh, he got the idea. He credits uh, Heinlein um, with with that notion. And uh, I will stop talking there. Tony or Greg, do you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Heinlein's future history, and then we can talk about um, and the idea of a future history and how Anderson used it for the Psychotechnic League, and then later on as well. Sure. Well, I I wanted to do a future history. Everyone who read science fiction you know, starting in my younger years, uh, wanted to do a future history. So I, I would lay out timelines based, of course, upon timelines in mind. And uh, it, it's interesting for me to go back and take a look at what Paul was doing. Um, he was taking a different approach than Heinlein, but still definitely influenced by Heinlein. And I think we all were. And as I recall, Tony might know more about this, the, the, the actual timeline that Heinlein devised was suggested to him by John Campbell who suggested so many interesting uh, things, like suggesting the three laws of robotics to Isaac, because he says, I find all these laws in your stories. Why don't we just write them down? <laughs> but the, the, the book that was published uh, the, I, may, may have been published in Astounding as a timeline. And then Heinlein, you know, wrote it up, and it was published in a book form. And uh, that just knocks my socks off. It's, it's a future history, and future history is an idea that is so amazing. Uh, it se- seems today, I think, perhaps more commonplace than then, but this kind of idea would influence science fiction writers, it would influence comic, comic book writers, it would influence movies, all sorts of stuff would happen along that line. Yeah, um, Tony, do you have anything to add to that? Or Well, uh, um, how does... Uh, um, the only thing I was thinking, I was trying to remember how it came about that... I. From uh, from uh, the recent Heinlein biography, um, how it came about that that thing got published. I believe that Heinlein had worked it out, and then Campbell saw it and said, "I want to put this in the magazine." That makes sense. It became too. public it, after yeah. that, and so he had to like, you know, <laughs> he felt constricted by it in a way. So <laughs> That's why he didn't want it published very likely. <laughs> And then as far well, as yeah, my well, dad's timeline for Psychotechnic League, I don't remember ever seeing that document. Um, so I don't know when he might have started it and, or what it, what it might have looked like. Um, but it's interesting that he got started with this what really, was, relatively early in his career. I think his... the first story was in... Ni- Go ahead, Astra. I'm sorry. Oh, I was saying... Um, I mean, it's interesting that he got started with it in 1947. So I don't know if he started a document uh, with the future history at that time, or maybe realized a couple of years into it that oh, these things kind of all go together, and let me let me pin this down, and you know, as I write stories, I'll see how they fit into this this larger this larger thing. I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any insights into. It. Yeah, so the, I I don't know I don't know if when it he actually wrote it down to start. There is a. Um... A sort of a grid in, and I wish I had this at my fingertips, an early 50s uh, issue of probably astounding. I can't, don't quote me on that, where he does have um, this timeline with with uh, works that he has yet to write. And some of those uh, were later written, and some of them were later written with different titles, and some of them never happened, and other stories did. Um, so there, there is a, um, there was a, dating back to the early 50s, at least he had written something down. Um, later, uh, when Sandra um, Mizell, um, who uh, we'll talk about here in a moment, um, wrote the interstitial uh, uh, material for the tour Jim Bain books, uh, she took that and expanded it. Uh, using, you know, in retrospect, everything that had been published. So, but at least or by the early 50s, he had an idea of what he was wanting to do and had it written down and it was published. So, um, yeah, as you said, it's interesting because it is early in his career, right? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to see Which, an image of that. I don't know if that's going to well, be included I, in um, one of your uh, yeah, one of your the, re- uh, yeah, there there will be. Yeah, the third one will have the the updated version. I can find you the original too and send it to you. Um, I've got a scan of it. So we should mention that David is the force behind com- compiling and getting right these uh, these volumes we're putting out on the Psychotechnic Leaks. Yeah. So blame me. And thank you, wrong. David, and, 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 <laughs> yeah. and I appreciated your um, your introduction there too. I thought that your preface to Volume One. Um, was oh, a, thank you. A nice thank piece you. of work. Yeah. that laid it out well, and um, looking forward to uh, seeing what you have to say in the beginning of the other volumes. Yeah, me too. I have to think of something, but um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I I really like I enjoyed writing that. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about this the the concept behind the Psychotechnic League. Um, I can do that, but I would rather have one of you all. I know, uh, Greg and Astrid, you said you, you reread the, this first volume here this week. Um, do you want to set it up for listeners? Uh, what, what the Psychotechnically uh, Future History is all about? Uh, Greg, do you want to take a stab at that, or shall I? Well, uh, just looking at it, it's a, uh, a post-World War III future history that involves a group of individuals associated with the United Nations, which is an interesting concept for poll, for the later poll, uh, uh, trying to to keep everything on the straight and narrow and, and working with a possible way of predicting or, or guiding the way the future will work with a rational approach. And that's, of course, that reminds us a bit of foundation. So there's a little bit of that uh, future history, uh, um, almost psychohistory approach there. And that might have influenced Paul too. But the Psychotechnic League is is a group devoted to this discipline. And I'll let Esther take it off from there. And and so he's also drawing on his readings in politics and history. And um, uh, there's this amazing, uh, bubbling ferment of of political theory that the characters are discussing sometimes at rather great length um, in the in the volume one. Um, and just ideas kind of bouncing off uh, in really a pretty marvelous way. Um, and then it's also tying into, uh, you know, psychology and the human potential movement in terms of, um, you know, the people, if they, if they have the discipline, um, mental discipline and skills can do amazing, amazing things. Um, so, which is, is mostly kind of the key focus of the story of the sensitive man that's in this collection. Um, so there's there's no superhuman pe- beings, but there's um, people unlocking their their innate potential um, in, in rational ways. That that's a major theme in science fiction from the 40s on, maybe from the 30s on, is this notion that you can be a better human being uh, not through chemistry but through logical discipline, and that certainly you know that that carries on through the Dune series later on. But Paul really ran with it in terms of, uh, of of just an amazing back and forth about the history of his time mixing with the future history that he's devising here. And he's he's throwing these ideas out, and as I'm rereading these stories, I'm going, this is amazing. This is what made science fiction so extraordinary for people who were nerds back in the 40s and 50s, is these stories gave them so much material to think about. It was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, dealing with a high-energy uh, drink here of, of ideas and, and rereading these things. Paul is second to none in terms of his ability to prognosticate a kind of future that is totally believable. Right. And, you know, there'll be you know a pivotal event and then the, the, the logical consequences from that and branching paths and so on. Um, so it's 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 really kind of a tour de force of of predictive, not serious predictive, but just following political trends and uh, the the Heinlein phrase: "If this goes on, you know, then then what happens next?" Right. Gregory Benford described science fiction to us as as a dialogue, where you're just constantly every writer is in dialogue with all the other writers, and you're all in dialogue with your fans. And when you get together at conventions, the fans come up to you and. And 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 discuss and, and suggest things, and the writers borrow from each other. Sometimes we steal from each other, and all of that is in fact completely true. And there's so much material that Paul laid down that just bubbles up elsewhere too over the years. I mean, you, you can find it in in science fiction TV shows. You can find it in movies. All these things that are going on 
bubble out into uh, the whole reach of popular science fiction. Yeah, one thing um, that I love about, and it's not to say that people are not writing this kind of science fiction today, they are, but the, from that period was you had, yeah, just like you say, such a rich um, cocktail of interesting ideas coming together in ways that no one had really thought about before. And, um, but at the same time, these stories are very, like, they're fast-paced kind of espionage adventure tales with really strong characters at the same time. Absolutely. And, you know, I was, um, you know, they're almost James Bondish. some of the uh, actions mm-hmm. that are going on here is this is astonishing feats of this and that. And it's pre-James Bond. I, I looked that up. The, uh, Ian Fleming was publishing just a little bit after um, that. But So there, the idea of the uh, this the strong man of action is, was definitely out there and probably following on from World War II. There'd been, you know, amazing heroic stuff going on then. Because, again, these, you know, 47, 51, 53 is when the stories in this volume one were coming out. So that was very fresh uh, in the consciousness of everybody. Well, Paul leaped onto the stage pretty prominently right away. And being a writer for Astounding and a number of other magazines, he really attracted a solid support from John W. Campbell Jr. and a readership really early. So, Castro, when was your dad a guest of honor at a World Science Fiction Convention? I think it was later in the 50s, like about 59 or so. Um, uh-huh. But, yeah, rel- relatively quick for a, an emerging writer. Well, he, he was also quite celebrated in the, in the, through the 50s and, and a real appeared. A lot of different stories, a lot of different series appeared in Astounding, but also other magazines. And he was a wide-ranging writer. He could write fantasy. He could write the science fiction. He could write these future history stories. He could write philosophical science fiction. Uh, he loved it all and sat down to do it. I think he, he just could create a whole range of these, of these uh, uh, visions and tastes. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the um, politics, not to get too political, but um, in his afterword that is reproduced here, this was an afterword he wrote in the 80s when um, Jim Bain brought these out, uh, <clears throat> collected them all together. Um, he talks about he abandoned this in the, in the last one was written in 68, but he had mostly left off. Uh, this by the mid fifties. And part of the reason uh, which I, in in my little preface, I said was great for the world, but maybe not so good for his stories was that world war three didn't happen. Um, so, uh, you know, a a mixed bag that we didn't. Sure. Um, but it did not happen as he had predicted. And he was saying other technologies that he did not predict, you know, it just became cumbersome to, uh, try to carry this on. Um, and the other reason is, he said, his um, his politics had changed quite a bit. Uh, as you said, in the Psychotechnic League stories, uh, there's a one-world government, um, kind of the UN is the one-world government, but um, uh, he no longer thought that was a great idea, and I wonder if we could just talk about that a little bit. Um, like I said, I don't, we don't have to get too political, but I just think that's an interesting um, shift that happened there. Um, yeah, he was. You know, he voted. Liber- he voted libertarian for the last few elections that he voted in. He he died in two thousand one. Um, so he he definitely became more conservative as he got older, and um, um, you now that's just part of what he was. Yeah, his politics were fascinating, but uh, he also he also wanted to ch- help shape the future too so when we were working with uh, larry niven and jerry pornell and their group in the citizens advisory council paul was there and he was hoping to diffuse the last possibilities of the uh, a third world war uh, by helping create missile defense and all that kind of thing and that was a hugely interesting and controversial project that he was involved in but he was dedicated to it um and I think what was happening was that the whole one world concept had started in the 1930s, possibly Wendell Wilkie, although I won't, don't quote me on that. But uh, the whole notion that we needed a world government is found in Asimov. Asimov, I don't think, ever really lost that, uh, that urge. Uh, uh, Heinlein dabbled with it, but Heinlein was kind of a little more critical of the idea. Uh, and, and Paul is, is working commercially out of that particular philosophy. And as he, as he develops, he says to himself, oh, I'm not sure I can convince myself of that. Um, so that, uh, he also grew away from the whole United Nations concept of the Cold War 
progressed, and they seem to be less and less effective. Uh, but the, the the notion of getting more and more conservative is he was actually changing his approach from a one world approach to a more diversified approach, and uh, that's that that could be an entire study of its own. And perhaps Sandra Meisel has uh, uh, discusses this in her interstices, as you put them, because she's very good at what she's very aware of what's going on here. But he was also definitely um, he remained anti-authoritarian. Uh, throughout yeah. his life, um, and um, so the uh, the government of Venus that's in the big rain in this uh, collection, um, you know, he's showing you piece by piece how truly awful this isolated, uh, power-hungry group of people are, and then um, the, the character is working to overturn that. Um, so I think that that general idea is something that he kept throughout his life that authoritarianism is a it's a bad bad thing which i think a lot of writers would have agreed with and certainly his his mentors you know think about uh uh Seamock with city and and uh, Heinlein Seamock w- was often a kind of a uh, 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 pastoral writer he liked the ideas mm-hmm. of of people living in the countryside and so on and and that was his uh his his approach um Heinlein was and, you know, I think my dad also, systems. Uh, speaking of pastoral and Simak, um, you know, I think my dad might have picked up on and, and loved writing about the natural world and does it beautifully um, in a way, way similar to the way Simak does, you know, evoking the countryside. For, for Simak, it's often the, uh, the Midwestern plains and so on. And for my dad, it's more um, diverse around the world. So it could be... Um, uh, the mountains in Canada or uh, islands off in the Pacific somewhere. Um, uh, but he he loved writing about nature and, and, and really did it very beautifully, I think. Yeah. And he p- pretty clearly wanted to be a Viking or thought he had to. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he does the sea very well. He does, yes. And it, so his dad had a uh, sailboat that he had built um and so they sailed around in um the gulf of mexico uh when he was a young a young boy um and then he did s- some sailing with friends later on as an adult and he and jerry pornell memorably tried to sail jerry's small sailboat from seattle down to uh, the los angeles area after jerry had moved from moved from seattle and they didn't. They didn't make it out into the Pacific Ocean because a horrible storm came up and they got stuck at Cape Flattery, Washington, for for days and days and ran out of time. But um, uh, mm-hmm. that was a, a a memorable time indeed. Um, well, we mentioned um, Sandra uh, Mizell again. Um, so what she did, um, and she's going to be uh, writing some new ones for the stories that were not collected when uh, they put this together. Um, I think. You know, in his afterward, uh, Paul Anderson says how he wasn't really quite sure how to handle this because it's the 80s now. I haven't written anything in this. It doesn't really match up. And what she did was uh, pretty clever, I think, which is that she kind of repositioned this as an alternate his an alternate future history. And I think it works really well um, in, in that way to think about it. Um, rather than try to go back through and monkey with things to make it line up, which... Um, sometimes works better than others, but often feels weird to me when authors do that. Um, I just wonder, I, you know, I know that, um, Bain books, um, excuse me, <coughs> goodness. Okay. I know Bain, uh, now we're reissuing quite a few, uh, Anderson titles. We mentioned High Crusade. We've done the, the Dominic Flandry books. Um, going to be doing the Hoka books, uh, that, uh, he wrote with, um, Gordon Dixon. Um, and of course, the, the second and third volumes of this uh, Psychotechnic League. But um, Paul had a relationship with Jim Bain when, when, before Bain Books. And I just wonder how, uh, if you guys had any insight of how that uh, working relationship came about. I think they probably well, must Bain have met was, was... at a science fiction convention. And yeah. um, Jim was uh, pr- probably bought something from him. And, and they got to be good friends. And, um, you know, just stayed in touch and enjoyed hanging out with each other. And when Jim moved on to, to Bain books, um, you know, he took the opportunity to publish more of my dad's stuff. I remember, uh, and I were at dinner with Jim once and he was saying something like, 
it's the easiest thing in the world to make some money off of Paul Anderson and just grab some stories together and put them out in the collection and they make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, Jim was also editor of Ace when a lot of the uh, paperbacks of, of Paul's collections were put together with uh, Michael Whalen uh, covers. And uh, Jim, before that, had been editor of Galaxy Magazine. That might have been where he bought a story from Paul. Mm. But, but, uh, yeah, but certainly yeah, at right. Ace, he was publishing a lot of Paul's stories. And then when he moved on to Bain and was able to get his own imprint, uh, you know, uh, plus uh, about that same time period was when the Citizens Advisory Council was really taking off. And Jim was frequently there, too. So there's uh, Robert Heinlein there, there's Jerry Pornell, there's Larry Niven, there's Jim Bain, there's Paul Anderson, there's me, there's Dean Ng, there's all kinds of Gregory Benford and a lot of writers there. Uh, and and it's it's quite a fermenting place. So that was a place where you could lock up a professor pretty easily. Um, well, we're kind of... Up against the timeline, uh, we could keep going, of course, but we've got two more volumes of this. We might want to do this again, so maybe we shouldn't talk about everything. Um, I'd like to ask them about their, the how um, how Paul Anderson was as a father-in-law to Greg, and how just some of the I, I've always just been interested personally in how you guys got together and and what that uh, what that entailed. Um, approaching well, this, we, this rather daunting uh, fellow that was your <laughs> your girlfriend's uh, dad. <laughs> well, that, you know, I, I first saw Astrid in '66, and then I saw her again in '68 at, at Bacon, and uh, so I was aware. But also, I was this a was reader a of Paul Anderson, right? Uh, I, I was a, a, an avid reader of Paul Anderson, and from uh, analog, I read all the analog issues. It was the first magazine I collected, actually, and was aware of what he was doing. In high school, we'd discuss the stories, uh, and and uh, eventually, what happened is that around seventy three, seventy four, um, certainly by seventy five. Paul and I were reading each other. Paul was reading my story. Certainly he read the analog story that I published in 76, The Martian Recorso, and and observed that uh, that this was, you know, pretty good stuff. And I, I, I kind of thought that was a very flattering. Uh, Astrid and I had already kind of started to try a relationship on, but had broken it off, and, and we'd get back together again in 80. And uh, and when uh, before that, we would get together with I would get together with Karen and Paul at conventions, and we'd just sit down and talk, either at parties or at lunch or whatever, and it turned out that he was just really easy to get along with. I think he was a little bemused when Astrid and I got together and it looked like we were going to get married, uh, but he didn't take it amiss, and he was very tolerant of this young whippersnapper, you know, still acquiring his chops as, as a professional writer. Uh, fortunately, uh, that happened fairly quickly, within five years. And uh, and and I was, you know, just very pleased to ask Paul and Karen for help on doing these books. So, so Paul and Karen helped me with the uh, the orbit and the language in Eon. Karen with the language and, and Paul with the orbital mechanics. Uh, and so that was a good start and, and Forge of God as well. Uh, and so I put them, you know, in the acknowledgments because they really were very helpful. So it was just amazing to have a resource like these two people, Karen was always visible to Paul in his linguistic achievements and some of the historical researches and in their travels. And uh, they kind of partnered on, on nearly all the books he wrote. And so to have access to that a duet was pretty astonishing. But Paul was very, very tolerant of this young guy. And uh, and we, we got along famously. That's cool. Yeah, I think he was. I think was quite um, delighted with Greg's success and um, and and proud of it, and um, you know, happy to see that he was doing so well. Yeah, but every were, time we were together, it comes to the involved house. Involved in science every, fiction. Sorry. Yeah, every, every time uh, Paul would come to the house, I'd have a stack of books for him to sign. So that was always good too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we writers enjoy. Um, I wanted to ask Astrid about her involvement in the science fiction community as well. I mean, you didn't have to become involved. Um, I guess you were you, – you, you, that grew organically um, and outside of just being uh, Paul and Karen and uh, Karen's daughter. You right. Were a big no, it was, it was it a big, like. It was a big part of our – it was a big part of our social life um, growing up in the Bay Area in the 
1960s, um, we went to Little Men's Meetings, which was a science fiction club there, and um, then also the Society for Creative Anachronism got started, kind of branched off from, we, we knew a lot of those people from the science fiction community. There was a big overlap when the SCA first got started. Um, so I had friends, and we went to, you know, the science, we went to WesterCon every year, um, the West Coast Convention, and then WorldCon sometimes when it was convenient. Um, so I had friends there on my own. Um, and then as those friends started putting on conventions, I wanted, wanted to be involved. So I was on a couple of convention committees and did various things. So it, it was just, you know, part of the community I grew up in. And, um, you know, you want to be part and do some things. And like you say, grew organically. Yeah. Like, for instance, um, you, were, uh, you were a masquerader like serious, seriously talented, or are, right? Uh, back in the day, though, uh, you're, you're heavily right. in the, she was a master. Crew, I think I remember. She was a master yeah, costumer, and she... I haven't done it in some, some years, but my, my mother started doing that. So she was doing convention masquerades, you know, when I was very young. And so I thought that was a neat thing to do, and... Um, you know, she taught me how to sew and would help me with some stuff. And then I went on and, and did costuming on my own. Famously, we did one costume together at the um, 1969 World Con at St. Louis Con, which was the Bat and the Bitten, which everybody who was there still talks about it to this day. It was, was pretty dramatic. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's well, photographic there's evidence of it out there. Well, I've, I've always heard you were crazy good at it. So. Well, thank you. I I you know, I, I was most active when costuming was kind of simpler than it became in the in the 1980s. It got really, really elaborate, uh, 80s and early 90s. And I had mostly done my best work in the 70s and early 80s. Um, so I was able to to win three major prizes at um, uh, conventions and uh, became what's called a master costumer. If you've won three or more, it's uh, but back, back when it was easier to do, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun and, uh, and, and an art form peculiar to our community. The one or two minute presentation um, performance art uh, thing. She even got me up on stage for one convention and uh, we did a performance together and she was great. So it was Tremendous fun. We had Gary Owen announcing us at that. I think it was a Comic-Con, wasn't it? It was at Comic-Con, yep. And, of course, Gary Owen was the announcer for Laugh-In, so that was great. That was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah wow. He did a great job of it. But it is interesting. Um, this is a whole other podcast topic. Tony, maybe we should do this sometime. But um, just how much the cosplay um, is just is part of... <clears throat> You know, people go just to do that now at conventions. You know, I've got friends who go to Dragon Con and they go to panels, but they're really there just to to cut to you know show off their costumes. And um, this it's fascinating to me how that's evolved over um, time uh, in the in the in the field. So in the fifties and sixties, people were getting involved just to uh, to play poker. At the convention, so a few rooms full of smoke and poker players. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people had their had their hobbies. Uh, science fiction was just a goddamn hobby. Was actually one of the major phrases. Um, but then, science fiction as a way of life was also the al alternative phrase. So. But there were fandom poker players. There were costumers. Fandom is a way of life. True. And, fa and, and fandom um, was pretty extensive because that included self publishing. It included. Um, fanzines, and, and to my mind, the fanzine revolution in the letter columns and the magazines and the journalistic uh, fanzines of the 20s and so on, kind of the beginning of the Internet today. Absolutely, a very slow Internet. There'd be yeah. people, you know, corresponding with each other. You know, the, the magazines would have the letter columns and the addresses would be printed in the magazines. So then so-and-so in Cleveland would write to somebody in Chicago and they would strike up an acquaintance of their own and then they might go visit each other. And um, uh, So very slow, there would be very slow flame wars happening via the Postal Service. 
<laughs> yeah, can you so imagine the, you know, having to wait uh, the until internet, the next month until the, the answer came back? The Internet still retains the, the whiff of mimeograph fluid. It does. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. All right, this um, is, well, we can't open this deluge up yet, David, so perhaps we can. Yeah, okay, let's not do that. Uh, What's going on with uh with with the next volume um what do we know about where you have it and maybe find out from greg what his projects are right now yeah so um volume two and volume three i've just kind of got to apportion them um because those are the ones that have new stories in there and uh we actually have to decide there's a whole novel called the peregrine which was also published as starways um though uh, according to his forward uh Paul Anderson preferred the title of the Peregrine. And so I've got to talk to Tony Weisskopf if we want to um, put that in a volume or if we want to do that as a, a separate piece. But um, regardless, that will be uh, uh, in uh, coming up. And um, <clears throat> yeah, there's uh, quite a few more stories. These, they go uh, further afield. You know, we're in Venus here um, in volume one, but uh, this this covers like a thousand years of history, of future history, and branching out into the stars. So uh, everyone's got that to look forward to, I guess, uh, in the in the coming volume. So is volume two going to be coming out next year? Then probably. Yes, volume two is scheduled for February. Uh, so I need to move on it. <laughs> <laughs> but um and as i and, and, and as i said um you guys are making me sweat here doing this now um sandra mizel is going to be doing uh, we're going to be reprinting her interstitial material as we did in this first one but she's also going to be writing uh new pieces for um the, the uncollected stories that um have never appeared uh in a psychotechnic league volume so uh if you like the psychotechnic league stuff this is going to be the definitive edition of it and yes two is uh in february and three is sometime next summer i would have to look at the exact month so well excellent so we're pretty close, i look forward um, to rereading series of releases yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Like it's going to be so. all together under one cover and, and and nice that sandra's doing some more of that um future history material that kind of ties it all together. Yeah. And as I said, we're also Hocus, Hocus Pocus and the other, you know, the, the Hoka books that he uh, co-wrote with Gordon R. Dixon. I do not know when those are coming out, but I do know that that is happening. So, cause we've also been doing uh, Gordy Dixon's books, um, reissuing a lot of those. So um, Bain is, uh, I think um, doing a great service to everybody, keeping these, uh, these old masters in print. If I, if I do say so, <laughs> um, so, absolutely, uh, uh, it's great stuff, and it's much appreciated. Um, Greg, Tony had asked, and I'm curious too. What uh, what have you got in the works as far as uh, upcoming um, books or stories? Well, they just uh, just published all three of the War Dogs volumes in a one volume set. Well, that's available from uh, Orbit now, and uh, I'll be getting to a new contract. I hope real soon now. Uh, for uh, for three books, uh, a trilogy that I'm working on, and then I'm at the moment I'm I'm kind of taking uh, uh, an extended vacation by working on a fantasy that is Elizabethan in some respects, but also metaphysical and it's it's quite rich and strange. I'm having to learn Elizabethan grammar, and that's always fun. It sounds like quite the relaxing vacation studying Elizabethan grammar. But hey, you know, for a writer that's uh... <laughs> Um, uh, Paul did it, well, Paul did it in *Midsummer Tempest*, and I'm actually using his book as a model uh, for how how to do the dialogue in in uh, Elizabethan. And he does a very good job of it in *Midsummer Tempest*, which I also highly recommend. Are you guys bringing that out, or is that some other uh, publishing season? Um, I do not know, to be honest with you. I don't know if that's one we have the rights to or not. So um, I think *Midsummer, Midsummer Tempest* see. is available as an ebook from Open Road, and I don't know if there's a print okay. contract on it right now. Okay, very good. I highly recommend it. All right. Well, I just want to say thanks again. This has been a lot of fun um, hearing these uh, stories about the the great Paul Anderson, um, sort of from the source here. Uh, so I'll just say uh, thank you so much to Astrid and Greg Bear, and of course Tony Daniel. Thank you for being on. Uh, the book, again, is The Complete Psychotechnic League, Volume 1. It is out now, uh, so you can uh, 
go out and pick it up and read it and uh, wait with bated breath for volumes two and three uh, next year. So uh, thanks so much, everybody. Our pleasure. Thanks, Great guys. Great to talk with you. Thanks, David and Tony. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corville's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Are you acquainted with Mentor Yo? Tokol asked. The three of them were gathered round the galley table, the two human members with tea mugs before them. Tolly shook his head. It's not like we have conventions, he said. Given that what we do is on the gray side, we trade info and names when we do meet each other, but I've been out of the loop for a while. Yo might be a rising star for all of me. Talked sensible and knew protocols, had a real good idea exactly how much of a juggling act it's likely to be, slipping the contents of 13 into one understood that we're dealing with a ghost install and knew how that bears on the likelihood of success. He moved a shoulder and sipped from his mug. Don't like to tap any of my usual contacts, given there's two dead directors in my immediate flight path, he said. No sense spreading trouble around. I understand, Tokol said. I will query my contacts, if that would be helpful, Mentor Tolly. It would be, he said. Helpful, thanks. No trouble, Tokol said, assigning part of her attention to the search. Hazenthal stirred, then stilled, looking down into her tea. Question has, Tolly asked her. She looked up, frowning. I am ignorant of your work, she said slowly. But I wonder, given yourself and Pilot Tokel, is there a need for Mentor Yo's assistance? Tolly raised his eyebrows, but said nothing. Tokel therefore answered. I am not a trained mentor. At the most, I would stand as Tolly's assistant, she said. It might be that I would have some particular advantage in the juggling act of moving the Admiral into a more secure environment. It is also possible that I may serve as a role model, as I will be the first of our kind the Admiral will have met. She decided not to mention the Admiral's contact with Jeeves, which was not, she thought in her own defense, meeting. Nor could it be said that Admiral Bunter had met Beshimo, his creator, or possibly co-creator. I might lead by example, she continued, and saw Tolly nod. Just as a rule of thumb, it's better to have trained help on hand in a tricky operation, he said. 
If Yo's any good, is willing to be my second and follow directions, I can't see but what that increases the chances of the Admiral surviving. Hazenthal nodded and said, Mentor Yo knew you, your reputation. Tolly half laughed. Yeah, well, I've got some notoriety attached to me, he said, and it appeared he would say no more, which was a poor use, Tokel thought, of Hazenthal's curiosity. He is modest, she said, turning her faceplate toward the big woman and allowing a smile to be seen. His work with Elzenvok alone must have gained him a place in such textbooks as aspiring mentors receive. Elzenvok? Hasenthal repeated. One of my most notable failures, Tolly said, shaking his head. I am mistaken, Tokol said, when it seemed that again he would speak no further. He is not modest, but deceitful. The patient died, Tolly said. That's not a success. Tokol considered him. In fact, he did not appear proud, nor even humorous. Could it be that he truly considered the extraction of Elzin Vok a failure? She returned her attention to Hazenthal, who was watching him with care. Elzin Vok was an old intelligence who had been discovered by the scouts, she said, carefully keeping her voice neutral. The world was quite deserted, except for the dome which Elzin Vok inhabited, and it had been badly damaged. Elzin Vok claimed to have been the central administrative comp for the world where savage storms swept across the planet's surface for three local years out of every five. By the time it was discovered by the scouts, most of the surface metropolis, which Elzinvok claimed to have existed, had been destroyed. There were signs of an effort to erect a subterranean city, but... She paused, uncertain of the telling. But the underground city, Tolly took up the story, which Elzin had ordered built in order to protect his people was destroyed in a massive earthquake. Everyone who had shifted underground, about two thirds of the surface population were killed. Those remaining on the surface also died, if not in the quake, then in the storms that came after. Tolly drank off what was left in his mug and looked bleakly at Hazenthal. Elzin showed me all this. The scouts took copies of his files and histories and the weather charts. Elzin himself. Scouts aren't real happy with AIs, and an AI like Elzin, which had a tiny taint of old tech about him, they'd have just left him, maybe, and let nature finish off what it had begun but one of them came round to the notion that Elzin might still know valuable things. Things that hadn't been archived, answers to questions they hadn't thought to ask him. And so, she contacted me. The idea was to move him to a better environment, so the scouts could take him along with them, back to headquarters where the gods alone knew what they intended to do with him. He shrugged. Understand, Elzin was more than a little off course by the time the scouts found him. He'd convinced himself there was another city on the other side of the world, and he created an entity out of part of himself to be administrator of that other city. Sestina, he called it. Elzin and the Sestina administrator had long conversations. The Sestina administrator transmitted maps, food production stats, population growth. The plan was that as soon as the Sestina population hit 90% of dome capacity, they'd move 30% of the population to Elzin's new weatherproof dome. Tolly stopped and closed his eyes. There was, Hazenthal suggested, her big voice soft. No dome. 
Give him credit, Haz. It wasn't for lack of him trying, Tolly said, eyes still closed. The scouts figured he'd built a dozen before he ran out of material, every free storm season. And once the storms came up again, down they'd go. Elzen had pictures, he showed them to me, of that brand new dome, not a scratch on it, sitting right out on the plane. The same plane I could see from the window where there was nothing. Silence again. Tokel felt a slight internal twitch, which meant there was new information in queue. You moved this person, Hasenthal asked. This Elzen, as the scouts asked. We talked it over, him and me. He wasn't sure he should leave his people. There wasn't anything I could do or say that would shake loose the idea that he had people. In the end, though, I was able to show him the advantages of moving into a modern habitat. The move killed him? No, well, yes, I guess you could say that has, that the move killed him. The new habitat, see, didn't have any of those filters and simulations he'd built for himself over all those years. So when he looked out with his brand new sensors over his city, and he saw what I saw, a jungle of girders and blasted habitats half buried in dust. If he'd been human, I'd have said it broke his heart. As it was, he just stopped. I ran diagnostics. The environment functioned. The files were uncorrupted. There was room enough and more. But Elzen was gone. And the scouts didn't get their AI to interrogate. I imagine they had to explain the expenditure to somebody too, but that wasn't my problem. I got paid. I have seen, Tokel said, the tapes of the extraction process, mentor. The scouts themselves said they doubted anyone else could have brought Elzen safely into the new architecture, save yourself. The move did not kill him. If we must, let us say that his filters failed. There was a small silence before Tolly's mouth twisted and he looked up at her. All right, pilot. Let's say that. Very good, she said briskly. I have information. One moment. She brought the files forward and scanned them. One encoded in Jeeves's familiar and comforting protocols, the other flat and cold, mere facts garnered from those archives available to her, which were not filtered through Jeeves. Inkirani Yo she said to the two expectant humans in the galley, is a journeyman mentor, with two births and one transfer to her own name. She paused and added, one of the births was contracted by Crystal Energy Consultants. Tolly betrayed no distress. His pulse remained calm, his breathing relaxed. Hasenthal seemed confused, but not in any way upset. Crystal Energies owned by a man called Uncle has, Tolly said, apparently noticing her confusion. Uncle's been around for a long time. In fact, it just seems to work out for those of us who've tried to do the math that he came over from the old universe. Hasenthal frowned. Uncle is as Pilot Tokel? No, he's human. Best guess, again, from those of us who are more curious than sensible, is that he's serial, what you'd call a clone. He stretched and gave the big woman a grin, apparently enjoying her expression of careful neutrality. He's just a neighbor, has. You don't bother him, he doesn't bother you. Unless he has what he considers to be a good reason. He looked back to Tokel. We all wind up working for the uncle or somebody close once or twice. It's what comes of living on the gray side. What else has Mentor Yo done?
Tokel hesitated, as if she were consulting the document again, relieved at his phrasing. He was interested in field experience only. That was well. Mentor Yo also has a long list of assists from names known to me and to you also, I believe, Mentor. She swayed slightly on her lifters, a half bow in recognition of a venerable name in the field indeed. Mentor Yo assisted in a deactivation, serving as second to Fron Kellinit. Tolly stirred at that. She's good, Mentor Kellinit, he said softly. Worked with her myself. Yes, Tokol said, and closed the file. She angled her face toward Tolly, allowing serious eyes to be seen. I believe that having Mentor Yo on hand to lend her skill might be prudent. There can, I think, be no doubt of her discretion, given her choice of career. Tolly rubbed his nose, nodded. Agreed. I'll just call Ahab Isaias and give the Mentor the good news then. Shall I? That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Bain Consulting Editor and excellent fill-in podcast host David F. Sharad, to Taylor Penichon, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the sturm and drong of the engines of creation congealed into a fine brandy and poured over the cherry red glow of a million supernovas popping off at once. Plus, thanks praise and plaudits for Greg Bear and Astrid Anderson Bear for talking with us about the complete Psychotechnic League, Volume 1 by Paul Anderson. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.